Welcome to Recap. QQ here as usual. Uh, this double week recap format will probably become the new normal, but I don't think it'll be too much of a setback. Let's start off with Airplay. So Airplay is an event that the Society of Professional Journalists Region 3 and SBJ Florida are holding, organized by Michael Koretsky. It was intended to be a live stream debate between participants in the Consumer Revolt and their opponents, but since nobody opposing the Consumer Revolt is actually going to show up, some journalists are going to fill in for them. The confirmed journalists at this point in time are Lynn Walsh and Ren Laforme, with hints that there are two unannounced speakers at this point in time. Those seeking to inform Airplay viewers about the Revolt were, at the start of the month, Alan Bakari, Breitbart's only liberal libertarian columnist. Oliver Campbell, vocal and well-spoken Gamergate proponent and author. Mark Seb, owner of the Action Points YouTube channel and creator of several morale-boosting videos on Gamergate. Christina Huff Summers, freedom feminist, author, and scholar. She became involved in the whole thing when she produced a few videos defending gamers from what she calls gender feminists. Milo Yiannopoulos, another journalist for Breitbart, definitely someone you want on your side in a debate, and he focuses more on the culture war aspect of Gamergate. And Kathy Young, a columnist for Newsday, Real Clear Politics, and Time, and frequent contributor to the libertarian publication Reason. I said at the start of the month, because things have already changed since then. I'll get into that in a little bit. Let's stay roughly chronological. So usually Kresge himself writes these updates, but this one was written by Alan Bakari, and I think they chose Alan Bakari because every time Kresge writes something, he manages to accidentally or intentionally slip something in that ends up being the source of endless debate, and that would have made the call to action in this update a lot less effective. Basically, the call to action was that the SPJ was not able to cover the travel expenses for all the speakers. Oliver Campbell, Christina Hoff Summers, Mark Seb, and Kathy Young all had to set up crowdfunding pages in order to cover their travel expenses. It seems like having Alan Bakari deliver this update was a good idea because all of the campaigns were funded within two hours. But after this, there was an update storm, all from Koretsky. First, on July 13th, he attempted to answer some common questions. He addressed the myth of the SBJ not supporting airplay by pointing out that SBJ Florida is actually co-sponsoring it, and that the SBJ National has given airplay their blessing, but not their endorsement. He clarified why there's no gaming journalist actually participating. It's due to some of them thinking that it's going to be too aggravating and not worth the trouble, and others preferring to cover it instead of participating in it. He also outlined how the debate was going to work, with the morning debate focused on the five most egregious examples of unethical gaming journalism over the past five years, and the afternoon session covering broader topics. And that's where the issues started. You see, the morning schedule had changed a little at some time in the past, cutting the time for explaining what GG is down to less than a third of what was previously announced. And not everyone knew about this change until they saw it in this update. So then we get what I would call a very emotional sounding update the next day. It's a lot less cool and collected than Koretsky's usual updates, but it's still written in that first person style that he seems so fond of. Basically, Oliver Campbell and Mark Seb objected to this scheduling change, and they discussed their displeasure with Koretsky in a passionate conference call, with Alan Bakari witnessing. Both sides have their own version of these events, both sides clearly heavily tinged with emotion. Oliver gave his side of the story in a live stream after Koretsky published an article giving his side of the story. Koretsky sounded very upset, like he was having second thoughts, and he came to three conclusions. Those three conclusions were... Gamergate is slash and burn. Basically, he claimed that there's an inability to compromise. Gamergate is immature. He expressed concern at the inability for the three of them to resolve this in a timely fashion. And Gamergate is all-consuming, about how he regrets how much time and effort he has to devote to this whole thing. He concludes with the rather dramatic, maybe everyone else was right and I was wrong, that it, quote, isn't worth the time and aggravation. One of the results of this article, which portrayed Oliver Campbell in a rather negative light, Oliver Campbell announced that he would not be attending Airplay, and that he's refunding his crowdfunding money. So do you remember what I said in my first recap that mentioned Airplay? About not putting all your eggs in the Airplay basket? Yeah. The day after that, on the 15th, Koretsky revealed he had a hidden desire to publish Storify pieces instead of Airplay updates, with an update with the subheader, and no, I'm not making this up, the subheader really was, 
Top 10 terse Twitter retorts. Yeah, it's exactly what you expect. 10 people complaining about the update on Twitter and him coming up with clever retorts to them. The same day, he published yet another update, this time about how someone called him a racist on Twitter, because that's worthy of an article, right? It's basically a Twitter thread, screenshotted and then turned into an article. But this article showed something very interesting. Let me quote right from it. There are honorable activists, and there are callous lunatics. So he's doing it again. First of all, he's treating GG like a movement instead of like an event which happens to contain a consumer or a vault. And second of all, he's doing this whole good gator, bad gator thing. Again, allow me to state my opinion that we are all individuals and we're all responsible for our own individual actions. While I do see some people trying to turn GG into an identity, collectivizing successes while continuing to individualize failure, I think that this is something that you just can't do. If you treat GG as a movement and identity, it will necessitate either a formal structure or collective responsibility for everything that goes on under the hashtag. Or you can use the strategy that's been in place since the beginning and which I greatly prefer, which is to treat GG as a series of events, not a movement or a community or an identity, simply a series of events starting with a journalism scandal and containing a consumer revolt and a hashtag or a vault which you can cease or resume participation in at will. Then naturally, each person is responsible for their own individual actions. Personal responsibility, individuality, and all that good stuff. That's why every time Koretsky asks me to denounce harassment, it makes me very confused. He's asking me to take responsibility for the actions of a movement which I am not a part of, a movement that, in my opinion, shouldn't exist. Yep, you can take that out of context and post it on Twitter. I don't think the Gamergate movement should exist. But on the flip side, I don't think it really has ever existed. I think I can summarize my thoughts on this by saying that, to me, it looks like airplay is a carrot to get GG to act in a certain way. Because, as we all know, the stick didn't work. So my advice is to just do a little self-reflection and analyze your own behavior and see if you've made any changes to it as a result of airplay, and just think on it for a while. And for a starting place for your thoughts, I'd suggest that you ask yourself, why does Koretsky insist on calling us all Gamer Gators, even though he knows we don't like that? Just some food for thought. So what is my opinion on airplay? Well, unless someone takes the bait and tries to turn GG into some formally structured movement or tries to adopt leaders, as long as we keep our self-awareness about how this whole thing is affecting each of us individually, I don't think it can hurt us in the long run. I don't know how much of a help it's going to be either. I do hope one of Koretsky's goals is met, his desire to make coverage of internet events better. Because as both GG and Reddit Revolt have shown, and even exploding vans in the past, journalism has no idea how to cover these things that happen purely on the internet. Uh, I wouldn't expect miracles, though. So first, a little background information. The Hat 2 made a big, exciting announcement on Kotaku in action. Email campaigns are go again. Man the email cannons, folks. We're just waiting for a target to fire on. And along came Gawker with this terrible article. Remember, Gawker owns Kotaku. So what was this article about? Well, it's pretty simple. Gawker alleges that a gay porn star was trying to blackmail the CFO of Condé Nast, which is a division of advanced publications, one of Gawker's competitors. The reason that the gay porn star was blackmailing him was, according to Gawker and their anonymous porn star source, the CFO had tried to pay for gay sex from the porn star. So what does Gawker do when someone approaches them and says, Hey, I I'm trying to blackmail this dude. Could you help me out by publishing this article if he doesn't follow through? Well, Gawker fucking publishes it. Now, keep in mind, one of two things are true here. Either Gawker's anonymous source is telling the truth, in which case they outed a gay man who was married, were complicit in blackmail, and damaged this guy's life, or the anonymous source is lying, in which case Gawker libeled this man, still damaged his life. And this is all over a sex scandal that's really not in the public interest. Target acquired. Gawker. Email cannons. Fire. Information spread all over Twitter about Gawker's latest horrendous behavior. So much of it that the word Gawker managed to trend worldwide. Even Gamer Ghazi was pissed at Gawker. So how does that lack of journalistic ethics taste now, Ghazi? The SBJ ethics chair, Andrew M. Seaman, called Gawker out in a rather scathing tweet. <laughs> I have to read this. Quote, Hey Gawker, here's the SBJ ethics code. It's not much use to y'all now, though. 
Then Andrew Seaman went on to write an entire article about why Gawker's actions were in violation of the SPJ Code of Ethics. But best of all, MomBot on Twitter tweeted out an infographic by Jasperge107, which showed Gawker's advertising infrastructure for email targeting purposes. This tweet got picked up by both USA Today and the Huffington Post as an example of someone calling for advertiser boycotts, and both articles contained a live link to the Gamergate.me wiki page on Disrespectful Nod, where the entire advertiser boycott list is. So anyone reading that USA Today or Huffington Post piece would have a clickable link to the GG wiki with contact info for Gawker's advertisers and sponsors. Awesome job, you two. Congratulations. You made the news, and it wasn't a horrible smear piece. In response to the backlash, Gawker did take that post down, with Nick Denton issuing the least apologetic apology that I've seen since the Reddit revolt. But the damage is done. I mean, you can't really unrelease information. So taking the article down actually caused an even bigger shitstorm. But that's still developing as we speak, so I'll have to cover it next recap. Stay tuned. So here's a handful of smaller headlines from the month so far. There was another Gamers Are Dead style blitz, with the article count hitting double digits. They were all covering a study about how teenage boys think that the women in games are over-sexualized. Yeah, teenage boys. Surprising nobody, the study had some serious flaws, and most of the press absolutely ignored them. I'll link to a Tech Raptor and a Niche Gamer piece in the description that explains why it was so flawed. Mark Kern, who was the team lead of Vanilla WoW and the producer on Diablo 2 and StarCraft, opened the League for Gamers website for signups. Reading from its homepage, it will eventually be a consumer-focused gaming league, encompassing video games, board games, and pen and paper gaming, with the intent to promote positive gaming, good sportsmanship, research, learning, and advocacy for the gaming hobby. There isn't much there yet, but there is an open bug tracker, so if you want to contribute to its development, you can report any issues that you find. And finally, Kukuruyo published an article on Gamergate in Spanish, a language in which there's been very little coverage of the events so far. They're the artists that I commissioned to draw my background art, and they asked me to mention this. I'll put a link in the description for you to share if you know someone who could benefit from it. And that's all for this recap, folks. Again, I'm switching to doing recaps every other week, so don't panic if there's no recap next week. If I'm lucky, I might break 1,000 subscribers soon, which is a milestone that, quite frankly, I never thought I'd make. Thanks, everyone, for your support. Ciao!